good to have you meet with us this Easter Sunday. While we cannot meet in the normal manner, we can rejoice in the truth of God's precious word. And we praise God that is applicable in every situation, in every place and in every era. And as we come together this morning to spend time around God's word, uh, we just apologise that we know hymns this morning, but they may be reintroduced in the days that come. We're going to read together some verses of scripture that are found in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes and in the chapter 3 and, and words that are very applicable uh, to the time and age in which we reside. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and the verse 1 and we read, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. Time to break down and a time to build up. Time to weep and a time to laugh. Time to mourn and a time to dance. Time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. Time to keep and a time to cast away. Time to rend and a time to sow. Time to keep silence and a time to speak. Time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. We trust the Lord will bless his truth to each one of our hearts. And we're reminded that we are in a time at this moment, a time when we're locked in in our homes, a time when it is wise and prudent to take precautions with regard to the spread of coronavirus. And yet as this, these words of scripture remind us, there is a time and a season and a purpose to everything under heaven. Well, let's just bow together in a moment's prayer, please. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the truth of thy precious word. We thank you, Lord, that as we look within it and as we look at the passing of life and as we look at the, the sphere of life within society, we recognise that it is filled with times and seasons. Our Father, in a very natural way, our own life is recorded by the number of years that we live. We look at the year and its passing and we judge it by the seasons, the winter, the spring, the summer and the autumn. Dear Father God, as we come to thee this morning in prayer, we're mindful that we come before that one who is the great and almighty God. We come before that one who is sovereign in all the affairs of life. Dear Father God, we're mindful that while we look at things that are changing around about us, we recognise that nothing happens unbeknownst to the God of heaven. We recognise, Lord, that thou art aware of every situation in every country. Thou art aware of every difficulty in the life of every individual. And, Lord, the thought and imagination of every heart. Our Father, as we come to thee this morning, we do thank and praise you for your tender mercies and for your grace and for your goodness to us. And, dear Father, as we gather at this season of Easter, while our service is different and not in the usual format, yet we are reminded that it does not diminish the importance of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we come to thee this morning and we give thanks for that one, our blessed Saviour, that one who willingly went to the cross of Calvary, that one who willingly gave us back to the smiter, that one who willingly shed his precious blood, that old sinners and rebels such as we might be brought nigh in to the family of God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today that we can speak of the gospel, that we can speak of that good news, we can rejoice today that men and women can know salvation because of what Christ accomplished there on that middle tree. Our Father, we praise thee today for that cry uttered on that cross. There the blessed Son of God cried out, It is finished. Our Father, we rejoice that the work of redemption is complete. Lord, as we look at our old, unclean and sinful hands, Lord, there's nothing that we can add to salvation. Lord, the blessed Son of God paid that debt in full. Lord, we come in salvation by faith on that finished work of thy blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father God, as we gather before thee this morning, we do remember our land and our nation. Lord, we're mindful of this coronavirus that is moving across it at this time. Dear Father, we ask and pray that thou would undertake, Lord, for those families that have been bereaved. Lord, we ask and pray that comfort and strengthen them, be unto them all that they would need. Our Father, we ask and pray that in all of these trials, Lord, that they might recognize that there's a God, that they might know that grace and that comfort and that strength that thou alone canst give. Our Father, we think of those that are sick and we do pray, Lord, that in thy will and purpose that thou would restore them to health and strength again. Dear Father, we're mindful, Lord, of those that are involved in the public services and their provision at this time. 
We think of those, Lord, that uh, work caring in the community. We think of those in care homes. We think of those, Lord, that are laboring in our chemist facilities. We think of those that are laboring within the health service. Lord, we pray that you'd be with them. We think of those in the emergency services as well. And Lord, the work that they render at this time. We thank you, Lord, for their labors. And we do pray that thou would sustain them and keep thy protecting hand upon them. Dear Father, our prayer and desire is that all would look to that one who is the author and finisher of our faith. Our Father God, as we come to thee this morning, we do remember in particular the work here in Cash. Dear Father, we think of the families associated with the church there. Lord, we're mindful of those families that grieve at this time. We do ask and pray that thou would comfort and strengthen them. Lord, we ask and pray that you'd be unto them all that they would need, and that they might know that oil of joy for that spirit of, for that spirit of heaviness. And Lord, that they might know that comfort that only thou canst give. Our Father, we think of those that are sick and laid aside. We do pray, Lord, that in thy will and purpose that you'd raise them to health and strength. And Lord, that they might know thy grace and thy mercy and thy tender hand upon them in these days. Our Father, tarry with us this morning. Bless us as we read thy word and spend time within it, we pray. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask all of these things. Amen. Returning to read a different portion of scripture now this morning, uh, we're coming to the Old Testament scriptures, the book of Isaiah, and a very familiar portion, the chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to read from the verse 1 of the chapter. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless that portion of scriptures even to each of our hearts this morning. And could we say a warm word of welcome to all that are tuning in and listening to us, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on Facebook. And we trust and pray that you'll enjoy fellowship with us here this morning. And we do remind you that if we can be of any assistance, any spiritual help or advice, then please feel free to send us a message via Facebook. Send us an email or contact us on the church's telephone number. And please feel free to do these things. We would remind you to bear in mind our local congregation at this time. And we do pray especially for those that have been bereaved. We think of the Edwards family. And we do commend them to the Lord's Prayer at this time. And do ask you to pray for them. And do remember those that are sick. Those that are suffering, laid aside. Pray that the Lord in grace and mercy would touch them. And in his will and purpose raise them up to that better measure of health and strength. We do also ask you to pray for our land and our nation. At this particular time, there's much going on. You don't need me to explain it all to you. But the one thing we can do is pray. We feel our hands are tied in many ways. But we can pray. Pray that God would assist those that are laboring to prevent this sickness, uh, that they're treating those that are ill. Pray that the Lord would give them grace and help. We pray for those in authority over us, that they might know wisdom, uh, both in Northern Ireland and in the UK as to how they deal with this virus. And we pray that they lead, the Lord will lead and guide and direct them, and that in everything that they would do, that they would seek his direction in the affairs 
of our nation. And do also remember Easter Monday. We normally have our Easter convention and the martyrs. And this year that will not take place in the normal fashion. But there will be a broadcast on YouTube at half past three. Uh, that's under the Martyrs Church, Martyrs Free Presbyterian Church. And you'll find it there on YouTube. And there will be items there from past and from the present. And our moderator, the Reverend Gordon Dean, will be bringing a message on that occasion. So we do encourage you, if you're online, we encourage you to tune in on Easter Monday to that service at half past three. Let's just bow together in another moment's prayer before we come to focus on God's precious word. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for the living word of the living God. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction, for the challenge that is found within it. Dear Father, we do pray that you even bless us as we turn to the scriptures of truth. Father, I pray to take these old stammering lips of clay, touch them, Lord, with that live coal from off the altar, that we might be able to speak of thee and to uplift the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Tarry with us and bless us. Give us help, we plea. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask all of these things. Amen. Philip P. Bliss was an American hymn writer and a singer who was born in 1838. He was a contemporary of D.L. Moody and Ira Sanka, who organized many evangelistic campaigns in that particular time. And Philip Bliss at that particular time was in that era, and he is one who made a large contribution to the many hymns that were penned in that particular era. We're told, or it's reckoned, that probably around 200 hymns are credited to his name. And yet, as a man, he died at the age of 38 in a train wreck. And in that lifetime, he had penned all of those hymns relating to the things of God. Ira Sankey makes the comment that he said the last hymn that he ever heard Philip Bliss sing was at a farewell meeting in Chicago, conducted by Henry Burhaus. The hymn which he sang on that occasion was a well-known hymn entitled Man of Sorrows, What a Name, For the Son of God Who Came. It's also reported that Philip Bliss a few weeks earlier sang the very same hymn in the prison at Jackson in Michigan. And so as we think even of the words of that hymn, that title that he gave to it, Man of Sorrows, we are reminded that that's a, a title that finds its origin in the book of Scripture. Those are words that find their origin in the book that we've read together already this morning. There in Isaiah chapter 53 in the verse 3 we read, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You know, often we speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and we refer to him by the many titles that are found in the word of God. And there are numerous titles. We may term him the Prince of Peace. We may term him that one who is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But yet here he is described as man of sorrows. And for a few moments this morning as we gather here, via the internet this Easter Sunday, we want just to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to consider that title, Man of Sorrows. The preacher of a bygone day, C. H. Spurgeon, he said this expression, Man of Sorrows, is intended to be very emphatic. It's not a sorrowful man, but a man of sorrows, as if he were made up of sorrows and they were constituent elements of his being. Some are men of pleasure, some are men of wealth, for the Lord Jesus Christ, he was a man of sorrows. And as we think of this man of sorrows, we're reminded first of all of that title, a man. He was a man. We're reminded of his humanity. And we see that the one that is spoken of in these verses in Isaiah 53, it is a reference to the Messiah. It's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Whenever you look at the verse 9 of the chapter, we're told, and he made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And this is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a reference to the crucifixion. There we're told that he had his burial with the rich in his death. The Lord Jesus Christ was buried in that tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. We know that there in the crucifixion, he was crucified between the wicked, two thieves. And thus we see that this chapter, Isaiah 53 it is a chapter that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of what we're reading here relates to that blessed second person of the Trinity. And he was the God man. We're reminded as we read scripture of the Lord Jesus Christ that he was unique. 
He had two natures. He was God and man and two distinct natures and yet one person forever. The Westminster Shorter Catechism and the number 21 asks the question, who is the redeemer of God's elect? The answer is given. The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal son of God, became man and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. A unique individual. The next question asks, how did Christ being the son of God become man? And the answer is given. Christ the son of God became man, he taken to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, he conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin. That's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah describes him as a man. He was one, the son of God, and yet he took to himself that garb of human flesh. And that humanity is proved throughout the New Testament scripture. You can look at the opening chapters of Matthew, the opening chapters of Luke, and there you read the genealogies. We read how the Lord Jesus Christ, conceived by the power of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary, was born of a woman. Just like every other mortal that is found in this world, he was born of a woman. He possessed skin and bone and blood, the same as you and I, yet there was one distinct difference. As we examine the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was perfect. That's something no other mortal on this world can lay claim to. The Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. He could not sin. The theologian uses the term, the impeccability of Christ, reflecting that truth that he was unable to sin. The same truth is highlighted in Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, in the verse 15, we read these words. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. We're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ, in all the trials and tribulations that he faced in life, he never sinned. And what a contrast to you and I. Sadly, you and I, as we consider temptation, so often we're prone to, to fall victim to temptation. So often we're prone to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ, we read of him during that period in the wilderness, those 40 days, and there we have the devil. And old Satan comes and he knows the Lord Jesus Christ is hungry. And he says, why don't you make the stones into bread? The Savior rebuked him. He rebuked him with those words that we find there in Matthew 4 in the verse 4. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He rebuked him using the word of God. And there's instruction there for the Christian. Whenever you and I are tempted to sin by the devil, by the world, by the flesh, then we ought to turn to the word of God. That's where we find our answer. In. That's where we find our response to temptation. That was the case for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted there in the wilderness. We find as we look at Christ's very nature, we see there as humanity. Because as we read of him in that temptation, we recognize he was hungry. There's nothing more natural than being hungry, than being thirsty. And we find that was the same as you read the cries on the cross. You'll read there in John 19 in the verse 28, that the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, I thirst. That's a natural response. Hunger, thirst. This old physical frame that we reside in, it requires nourishment. And so in those aspects, we see the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of you and I today, we get weary and tired. Maybe you go out for a walk or you're doing some work about the house or maybe you go for a run and you come back and, well, the body's a wee bit sore than it had been. The muscles are, are sore. They're weary. They're tired. The Lord Jesus Christ got tired. As we read the scriptures, we find that concerning him there in John's gospel, in the chapter four, we read of him sitting down in the well, and it says, he, Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey. He was tired. He resided in a physical frame as you and I do. One that required food and water and one that got weary and tired. So as we think upon those things, we're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ felt pain and suffering and agonies just as you and I and we're mindful of all that he endured there on the cross of Calvary thus we see his humanity indicated in those responses of the natural body we see also that humanity brought forth there was evidence to others we think of the religious leaders 
And there in Matthew chapter 13 in the verse 55, as they speak of the Lord Jesus Christ, they ask the question, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this, is not his mother Mary? They recognize he was born of Mary. They recognize him living in the carpenter's home. They recognize his humanity. As we focus on the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice that he took on human form. We rejoice that he took to himself that garb of flesh, that he might take our place at the cross of Calvary, that he might bear our sin, that he might purchase salvation for his people. He did that which we could not do. He lived a perfect life. You and I, by nature, are transgressors, lawbreakers, but Christ was obedient to the law in every single way. You know, there are many in the world today, and they think they're not too bad. But when their lives are sat down by the measure of God's divine standard, the scripture tells us they're sinners. In Psalm 14, in the verse 2, we read these words, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's not my words. Those are the words of the God of heaven. He said, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. So as we think of mankind, we're reminded we're all sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ was different. He was perfect. You and I rightly deserve judgment under the law, but Christ took our place at the cross of Calvary. There in Galatians 3, in the verse 13, we read, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, but made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. But not only do we see Christ's humanity, but we notice also in the scripture his humility. As the man of sorrows, that humility was displayed in every aspect of his life. Isn't it interesting that he who was there at creation, at the formation of this world in which we reside, yet humbly came to reside, to live, to walk in this world, in the garb of flesh. We look at the scriptures and we find him born into that humble home of a carpenter. We find it as incarnation. He's laid there in a manger for his cot. Humility, there at his birth. Poverty, there at his birth. And it was the mark of his life. There was no extravagance in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were no great possessions there. In fact, we read his words in Matthew 8 and the verse 20. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes of holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. His birth, his life, and his death are all marked by humility. We've already made mention of the fact that he was laid in a borrowed tomb. You know, as you and I think upon this aspect of the Saviour's life, we're reminded of his purpose in this world. The purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world was not to accumulate wealth. It wasn't to attain high office or to attain fame in this world. Rather, the purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ coming to this world was to provide a way of salvation for fallen man. He came to this world to bleed and to die on the cross of Calvary that men and women might repent of their sin, that they might know that pardon that is to be found in Christ alone. Luke's Gospel in the chapter 5 and the verse 31, we read, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was the purpose in Christ's coming to this earth. He came in humility. So it reminds you and I as God's people that there ought to be humility in our lives and in how we conduct ourselves. As we think of what Christ did, we see the love that he had for fallen man. Imagine one who would leave the splendour of heaven and come down to a corrupt and fallen world. What an experience it must have been for the Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world and to walk upon this earth and there to see the sin and rebellion evident in the hearts and minds and conduct of men and women, to see their evil deeds and listen to their vile conversation. And yet he went to the cross of Calvary that such individuals might be saved. The amazing love of Christ. As we think of that hymn that has been spoken of, man of sorrows, we're reminded that within it there are those words, hallelujah, what a saviour. And we have to say that today. What a saviour. To do all of that for sinners such as you and I. 
such condescension is evident in his life, it's also seen in his death. As the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he was put to death as a common criminal. There on Golgotha stood three crosses, two thieves on either side, the blessed Son of God in the midst, scourged, mocked, and left to die. You know, when we think of the words that Christ spoke to Peter there in the garden in Matthew 26 in the verse 53, he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. All of that power at Christ's disposal, the power to call angels to deliver them. But he didn't do it. Why not? Because he loved fallen man. He came to this world that men and women might be ransomed, might be liberated from their sin and brought into the glorious light of the gospel. Well, the Apostle Paul sums up his life in the words in Philippians 2 in the verse 7. As it were, he, he takes the lifetime of the Lord Jesus Christ and condenses it into this. And he says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made himself of no reputation that you and I might be saved. What an amazing truth that is, child of God. And yet we're reminded that many today, while the Lord Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation for us, yet how many today are ashamed to mention the name of Christ? Yet how many today are ashamed to, to say that they're a Christian and to witness and to speak a word for our blessed Saviour? But we look at the wider world today. And we see a society that is quite happy at this season of Easter to, to speak about Christ and to speak about the crucifixion. They're quite happy when it comes to Christmas time to mention the incarnation and the birth of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet they have little time for his warnings. They have little time for his words. As you listen to the, the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, we find that his message was repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what he says in Mark, Mark 1 verse 15. You go over to Matthew's gospel and he says, Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Luke's gospel, in the chapter 13 and the verse 5, he says, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. There's the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. This one that so many people love to embrace at certain seasons and yet they turn their back upon the rest of his words when he says, Repent. Turn from your sin. Get away from your sin. Turn your back upon those wicked ways and seek for pardon and forgiveness at the foot of the old rugged cross. Friend, have you done that today? Have you repented of your sin? Or oh, at this season of Easter, there are many things that may occupy your mind, but this is a central theme of it, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what happened at Calvary was not an accident. What happened at Calvary was the very fulfillment of the covenant of grace whereby the Lord Jesus Christ would take the punishment that his people deserved on the cross of Calvary. Oh, we can think of many a soldier, and the story has been written of many a soldier that gives up their life for a country and for a nation and for their comrades. We think of a parent who maybe gives up their life to preserve their son or their daughter. But the Lord Jesus Christ gave up his life for the people that hated him, those that despised him, those that rejected him. How many will sit and they will listen to a news report and there will be tears in their eyes and maybe a hand over their mouth as they gasp and listen how a mother hands out her, her child out of the burning building and, and gives it to the emergency services to take it to safety. And then she herself perishes in that building. And we feel a heartache for the home and for the family and for the child that has lost a mother. But how many think about the Lord Jesus Christ? How many consider the agonies that he endured on the cross of Calvary and the suffering that he took at the hands of wicked men, all that sinners might be saved. Oh, for many, they can pass it by and it brings to their mind no thought of their sin. It brings to their mind no thought of eternal destruction. But dear friend, it ought to. As we come to this season of the year, it's not a time for holidays. The main point of focus is the death, the crucifixion, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the need to be right with God. 
You see, as we think of this man of sorrow, we're reminded of his suffering. Yes, there was sorrow in his birth. There was sorrow in his life. There was sorrow in his death. He knew what it was to suffer. He knew what it was to endure pain. And we find even at that very season of his death, we have Judas betrayed him. The religious leaders falsely accused him. Pontius Pilate dismissed his innocence and Roman soldiers beat him. The scriptures reveal as we read them that they plucked the hairs from his feet. They took that old scourge and there they ripped furrows in his back. The blood would have been flowing, streaming down his back. They took a crown of thorns, those long eastern thorns, and platted it into that crown and beat it into the brow of our lovely Saviour. That's just some of the physical agonies that he endured. Oh, as we read the scriptures, we find that he was made to carry the cross. And you can picture the scene. He's weak with the loss of blood after the scourging. He's exhausted with all of the suffering. And yet in agony, he's forced to carry that cross. You know, friend, as we look at Calvary, there's nothing nice about it. There's nothing lovely about it. It's a place of violence. It's a place of cruelty. It's a place of brutality. And yet there we have the blessed Saviour kneeled to a Roman cross and left to die. How often in all of the celebrations, the agonies and sufferings of Christ can be forgotten. How sad it would be if you and I today on what has turned Easter Sunday, forget about the suffering of our blessed Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought never to forget it. The hymn writer penned a hymn and the closing lines or the part of the chorus was, Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget that bloodstained crown. You know, we ought never to forget the suffering of our blessed Saviour. That's what sin does. Sadly, many today look at sin, they dismiss it. They laugh at it, they mock at it. It's, it's not important. That's only a Bible thing. That's only for those Bible thumpers. My friend, sin is serious. It was sin that put the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Your sin and my sin. And you will be judged before God for what you've done with God's offer of salvation. Sin is not light, it's not frivolous. Sin is serious. And sin will be judged. And you will stand before God and give an answer for your sin. We think of the physical sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were more than any other mortal has ever endured. The prophet Isaiah that we've been reading in, in the chapter 52 and the verse 14, he says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. He endured a beating, the plucking of the hairs of his face, Far more than any other individual has ever suffered or endured. He took it all for you and I. But you know, we can look at the cross of Calvary. We can read of the nails. We can read of the thorns. We can read of the scourging. And our minds perhaps just focus on the physical suffering. And we can perhaps to a little degree understand a little of what it may have been like. But you know, the Bible reminds us that there was other pain that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered. Was that pain as he bore divine wrath for his people? That pain when the father turned his back upon his only begotten son. There in first, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and the verse 21, Paul explains it in this manner. He said, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, the innocent become guilty, that the guilty might go free. That's not normal thinking, but that's what the gospel message is. That's the good news for you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ bore the consequences of the sins of his people, that men and women who put their faith and trust in him might know forgiveness, they might know pardon, they might know peace with God. You know, we think of this man of sorrows. He was in human form. We've noted his humanity, and yet he was the Son of God. And all of that was made evident at the time of the crucifixion. Lest those that were watching, lest the onlookers should think this is just an ordinary man that's dying, the scripture tells us there were three hours of darkness upon the earth. The Bible reveals to us that there was an earthquake. There was the rending of the the veil of the temple. It was rent in twain from top to bottom. All of these things reminded those gathered around that this was no ordinary individual. That centurion that was watching on, he said, surely this was the Son of God. 
John Calvin makes a comment. He says, thus the majesty of Christ was attested by the obscuration of the sun, by the earthquake, by the splitting of the rocks, and the rending of the veil, as if heaven and earth were rendering their homage, which they owed to their creator. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God. His power is not only displayed there in the earthquake and the darkening of the skies, but it's displayed in the resurrection. That is the glorious part of this account. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, but praise God, he rose again the third day. By the power of God, he conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered hell. We rejoice today that the tomb is empty. We don't need to be looking at a saviour who is on a cross because he's risen today. He's not in the tomb, he's ascended up into heaven. He's there pleading and interceding on behalf of his people. That's the great truth of the gospel. We come to a God today who is alive, who is risen, who is victorious. We're not worshipping some individual that has been buried in a tomb thousands of years ago. But we come to a risen saviour. We come to a risen Christ. Yes, we have that title in Isaiah. Those words we've been considering, man of sorrows. He knew what it was to sorrow. He had stood there at that graveside of Lazarus and he wept. He knew what it was to experience agonies and pains and sufferings. And thus, as we think upon that title, that brings comfort to the child of God. We're reminded that our Saviour is a man of sorrow. We're reminded that there's no agony, there's no affliction, there's no thing that you and I can endure that Christ does not know about. In that time on the cross, he was on his own. He understands isolation. He understands loneliness. And thus, in all of the trials of life, He can comfort and strengthen his people. What comfort that is for you and I. Child of God, when all around us today, there's fear and worry. We can look to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can look to that one who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. We can look to him for comfort. We can look to him for strength. We can look to him for grace. And he supplies that which we need on every particular occasion. Dear friend, this morning, as we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're mindful of the suffering that he endured. He endured it all. He experienced all of this sorrow that you might know salvation. We mentioned those words earlier where he said, repent. He spoke to Nicodemus and he said, ye must be born again. Friend, is that your experience today? Have you repented of your sin? Have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? I trust and pray that you will. It's the only means, the only hope of eternal life. And we implore you to come and to get right with God. We read in 1 Peter 2 in the verse 24, Who in his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live on to righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Christ died that we might know salvation. Do not dismiss that sacrifice. Do not trample over the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but repent of your sin. Turn from them and come to the foot of the old rugged cross and cry out, What must I do to be saved? Cry out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We trust the Lord will bless these thoughts to each heart today. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for thy truth. We thank and praise you for that once for all sacrifice. By your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Father, we pray that men and women, Lord, even at this season of the year, that they might not get tied up with the celebrations, but rather that they would focus upon the person of Christ, that, Lord, on his agonies and his sufferings, they might recognize the seriousness of their sin, and, Lord, that they might cry out on to him for salvation. Father, be with thy people. We thank you, Lord, for that comfort, for that strength that we can have in Christ. And, Lord, might we each one look unto thee, that one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Tarry with us, bless thy people, we pray. For in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen.